you know, there's a very interesting story. I'm not going to turn and read it right now, but you've probably read it before. In Genesis, I think it's chapter 22, it tells the story of a man named Abraham. Anybody ever heard of Abraham before? In Abraham, God promised him a son, and the son was not forthcoming. And so Abraham and, and his uh, wife Sarah got together. She was barren, and he was old, and they didn't have any children. And so they said, well, here's, what, here's probably what God wants to do. He probably wants you to go into my handmaiden who's young and fertile, and then produce a child that way. So they did that, and guess what? That wasn't God's plan. God's plan was he was going to do it, <laughs> you know, well, even though Abraham was old and even though his wife was barren. Listen, God didn't know about all those restrictions. He can just do what he wants to do. So God then, after that, after they messed up, God then gave him the child of promise, and his name was Isaac. Isaac's name means laughter, by the way. That ought to tell you something about what God's desire for us is. God gave them the child of promise, which he, you know, even though Abraham, you know, did you know that God waited until Abraham, the Bible says, when he was without strength, she conceived. Now that's polite language by saying that Abraham, he, God waited till Abraham. See, in the beginning, Abraham had the capacity on the male side to do what was required, but his wife was infertile. God waited till Abraham uh, was was uh, had no capacity. See, God waited till neither one of them could do it and then could produce a child, and then God produced it. So guess who gets the credit for it? Uh, God did it. But God then comes along, and this is a very mysterious and unusual chapter. Uh, and he says to Abraham, Abraham, take that child, that child of promise, this supernatural child, Isaac. Take him up here on this mountain I'm going to show you and sacrifice Isaac. Take him. See, this God brought this word to Abraham, and here's what I require. Go up on the mountain and sacrifice Isaac as a burnt offering. Well, that's really strong and strange and unusual. We don't read about that anywhere else in the Bible. That, that just goes against everything else we read. He tells him, this is what I require. So Abraham, having that word from God, not knowing anything else. I mean, he said, this is what I require. And so Abraham set about to do it. And so while Abraham's going up the mountain, Isaac says, I see the wood and I see the fire. Where is the sacrifice? <laughs> and I like the King James because in the King James it says it this way. Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. Now, you could read that. God will take care of that. Or you could read, I like the way he said, God will provide himself the sacrifice. For so What God has said is, I require a death. And so Abraham was setting out to carry it out. But when he got up on the mountain and he was ready to perform what God said he had required, God stopped him. And he said, do not kill Isaac. Look over here in the bushes, Abraham. There is a lamb. A ram, actually. But a ram is a male lamb. A ram is caught by its horns in the thicket. Sacrifice him in the place of Isaac, your son. So in the end, God, uh, Abraham called that place Jehovah Jireh, which means Jehovah has foreseen and provided. That's what that means. Jehovah Jireh means God provides. What the real message of that story was, God gave a requirement, but then He came and brought a second word, and He said, wait a minute, I will myself fulfill what I required. See, Isaac didn't end up dying. A, a lamb ended up dying in the place of Isaac. So God made a requirement, but then He said, I'll step in and, and and fulfill what I have required. Did you know that's a beautiful picture of what God did in saving us and in our redemption? He gave some very strict and severe requirements throughout the whole Old Testament. But you know what? There's not a man or woman on the face of the earth that's ever lived up to God's perfect requirements. And if there was, then we don't need a Savior. Did you hear that? But the reason God sent a Savior is because He gave that first word to tell you how high the standard is. So that, Really, the reason is so that you would despair and say, wow, I need a Savior. If this is how holy God is, if this is how perfect God is, I need someone to come and save me because I'm never going to get there on my own. You know? And the funny thing about it is when you read in the Gospels, the people who received Jesus were not the religious people, it was the sinners. The sinners and the, and the down and outers, they were the ones who first recognized that I can't live up to what God requires. I've got to have a Savior. And so the sinners all gladly heard Jesus. And they all flocked to Jesus. And guess what the Pharisees said? This man receives sinners and eats with them. <laughs> Jesus' answer to that was, He said, uh, you know, there was a man who had uh, 99 sheep and one was lost. And so He said, I'm going to go and search for the one that's lost and, until I find him. He left the 99 in the wilderness. And then he went to find the one that was lost. And when he found the one that was lost, he put it on his own shoulders and carried him back. Now I ask you, where would you rather be? In the wilderness or on his shoulders? <laughs> well, I'd rather be on, in an intimate position on his shoulders, close to him, you know. In other words, the message is, you Pharisees and you scribes and Pharisees, you think you're so righteous, I'll just leave you in the wilderness. I'm out to look for the one that's lost. The one that knows he's lost. So the point is, <laughs> what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. In flesh just like yours, Jesus came. And the purpose was to condemn sin. 
That is to say, your sin. To condemn sin in the flesh. Now, have we ever read that word condemn before? Well, yes. Uh, back in verse 1, he said, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The reason was Jesus went to the cross and your sin was condemned. So if your sin's already been condemned in the flesh of Jesus, then for you, because you believe in Him, there's no condemnation. It's already been condemned. Does that make sense? I think this is really good. Now this is the negative side. When we say there is no condemnation. On the positive side, there is something very positive. And I want to conclude with that. That we have that's the opposite of condemnation. We're not condemned. What we are, in Ephesians chapter 1, here's what we are. Ephesians chapter 1, I want to read you verse 6. All of chapter 1, or at least the first half, is talking about what's true of us because we're in union with Jesus. Verse 6 says this, Ephesians 1, 6, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He, that is God, hath made us, that's us, <laughs> accepted in the Beloved. The Beloved is Jesus. So it says, He has made us accepted in the Beloved. That's in Christ. Now, not only are you not condemned, but on the positive side, you are accepted. He has received us and accepted us, again, not because of our conduct, but because of what He did for us. Now, if it was up to us in our conduct, though we want to do what's right, let's be honest, we, we, we don't fulfill perfectly what God requires. So He gives us a better righteousness, a better life to be in, and it's the life of Christ. And I think that's pretty good in the King James, but you know what I really like? And I want to end with this. I really like what the message translation says. Anton, if you, would you go back to verse 3 and give me the message? And I want to conclude with this. I think this is very, very well said. I'm a big fan of the message translation. In verse 3, uh, beginning there. How blessed is God, and what a blessing He is. He is the Father of our Master, Jesus Christ, and takes us to the high places of blessing in Him. All right. Next one, okay. Long before He laid down earth's foundations, He had us in mind. You believe that? It says so. Do you know that before He made the earth in His mind, He says, someday there's going to be Jason, and I need to do something special for him. Someday there's going to be Tom and Diane. Oh, I can see it now. <laughs> someday there's going to be Troy and Lily. And Alice and, and everyone, so, you know, all of us. Just put your name in there. Someday he, 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 and I need to do something to prepare for them. Because I really love them. Even the, before we were born, he says, he had us in mind. He settled on us as the focus of his love. Think about that. He settled on us. This is what God did way before he ever even made the earth. He focused on us, uh, settled on us as the focus of his love to be made whole and holy. By His love. Okay, let's get another one. Long, long ago, He decided to adopt us into His family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure He took in planning this. Let's get another one, Anton. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of His lavish gift-giving by the hand of His beloved Son. Okay, let's get another one. Because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, that's Jesus, His blood poured out on the altar of the cross, we're a free people, free of penalties and punishments chalked up by all of our mis misdeeds, and not just barely free either, abundantly free. How about that? In other words, He didn't just pay the minimum, He paid more than He needed to pay. He paid extra. Let's get another one. He thought of everything. Provided for everything we could possibly need. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that? That means then you don't have anything to worry about in life. That means you don't have anything to be afraid of. Because if He planned, and or, or, let's just say this, if He knew about your life far before you were ever born, and He says, I'm going to take care of everything they need, then we can, uh, at least inwardly, we can rest in, in that kind of confidence that He's got our lives taken care of. He knows what we're going to need.